Welcome to First Corinthians Bible Study today. Uh, we have our very final uh, chat, uh, section of First Corinthians for our Bible study today. And uh, we see a little bit more uh, explanation of how the, the church in Corinth and instructions from Paul uh, in regards to how they might continue to labor in the Lord. Uh, that they might live out uh, the faith that they have uh, as a congregation together. And so encouragement from Paul, again, for the church in Corinth. Uh, but as we hear it, uh, we can apply it into our own lives as well. And so we'll take a moment and uh, look into our text. As we go through, again, we're going to make some observations. I have those things highlighted, uh, observations I notice. And as you follow along in the text at home, uh, there might be some things you notice or highlight yourself. Uh, um, this is something you can also do on your own as you study the text. But uh, you get some uh, things uh, from me today. Um, and so also then we'll take those things that we notice and we'll kind of dive a little bit deeper, uh, trying to come up with kind of what did the what is the broader meaning of those things? Um, how does then it translate into my life? And maybe there's a takeaway uh, of some sort of thing God is calling me to do or to believe uh, as I look at the text. And so, uh, again, we're in the conclusion of the entire book. Uh, in the chapter 16, there's a number of different things. And now we're at the very, very end where Paul gives uh, some greeting. He started uh, the book of 1 Corinthians with greeting to them. He ends kind of with another uh, follow-up agreement, an anathema where he curses uh, a certain practice that the, the church would have, a marantha, which means just a calling for Jesus to come, uh, and then a benediction uh, for his people. And so we will dive through these words. The churches in the province of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Priscilla greet you warmly in the Lord, and so does the church that meets at their house. All the brothers and sisters here send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. I, Paul, write to you this greeting with my own hand. If anyone does not love the Lord, let that person be cursed. Come, Lord. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love to all of you in Christ Jesus. Amen. So again, we're going to dive into some of those things that uh, we highlighted there in that text. And uh, we will look into the meaning of those things. So first, uh, we notice this section about the greeting, the, the churches in the province of Asia. Uh, again, one thing you find uh, as you read through the Bible, that unity within our church uh, throughout the, the, the world. And uh, that is something I think is important for us to ever foster, uh, that relation uh, with, you'll see there below, the brothers and sisters throughout the world. Uh, we are more united uh, with brothers and sisters in Christ in other countries throughout the world and also in other times of history than we are with uh, even a neighbor that is an unbeliever. And, and not that we don't have unity as Americans or uni, unity in our communities, uh, but our, our deepest unity is that family relationship that we have in Christ Jesus. And so we see this element of the universal church, a unity of the family, personal connection. We see here the names Aquila and Priscilla. They come up quite often in Scripture. Uh, they were probably active members in Corinth and also had moved uh, and were now active in uh, Ephesus, where Paul is, uh, they were probably very wealthy. And so they tended to have a, a large house where the, the church could gather uh, and that they had that, that impact uh, within the church that God had called them uh, to. Uh, so we get just kind of this unity, this uh, greeting, and also that personal connection. Uh, Paul wants the church in Corinth to remember that there is a personal connection both with the church where he's at and also with Paul himself. Uh, that this isn't just some outsider, but that th there is unity in this church. The church, even spread geographically, is one big family. Uh, and a blessing for us to always be reminded of that as well. Um, we also go to this next section where we see, if anyone does not love the Lord, let that person be cursed. Now, 
Paul makes here an anathema. Uh, he often does this uh, where uh, he, he makes very strong statements. I, I'd almost think uh, nowadays, I'm not sure that the American Christian Church would allow a guy like Paul around, uh, but uh, he very strong language uh, for this church to remember that uh, they need to be in Christ Jesus and to love the Lord. Uh, life uh, in the church, life uh, in this world is pointless without a true love for Christ and because of that also a love for one another. So you see here in the commentary um, this anathema. Paul seems to be casting his eye back over all these sorry divisions and this disobedience to the Lord. And uh, they're challenging on doctrine. They're challenging on uh, kind of this relationship with the Lord and also uh, the Lord's servants in Paul. Uh, the Corinthians, they love their love of human power and wisdom rather than the power and the wisdom of the crucified one. They love the worldly pleasures. Uh, in the case of the incestuous man, uh, they love the wrangling over property by means of lawsuits. Uh, they're resorting to prostitutes, the inclining and eating in heathen temples, and their desire for spectacular gifts all amounted to a, not a love for the Lord, right, but a human pride and love of self rather than this love of the Lord. There were some in the congregation who lacked what, what Paul calls the obedience of faith. And so, uh, yes, this is anathema. Uh, this is Paul being very strong uh, that uh, they need to love the Lord, uh, which isn't really a command. It's a great joy uh, for us who by faith have a relationship with him. And so uh, Paul just says, uh, if you don't love the Lord, uh, don't be deceived. You are under a curse. If you don't have love for the Lord and know his love. And so uh, he reminds the church that they, they need repentance and unity and, and love in the Lord. Uh, then he goes on and he shares with them um, this Marantha, uh, come Lord. Uh, this is good from the commentary. It says, like other Aramaic and Jewish words that become common coin in the early church, uh, they would bring in these non-Greek words, even though the New Testament is written in Greek. Uh, the word amen. Yes, yes, it shall be so, right? Hallelujah. Praise to Yahweh. Praise to God. Hosanna. Save us. Um, these common words that uh, we still use some today. We use amen and alleluia a lot. Uh, less so Hosanna, but we use it on Palm Sunday. Um, but then another word, Marantha, and I think it's just maybe, I don't know if it's just a harder word, but this is a rallying cry of the church. Um, this word, come Jesus, come Lord Jesus, uh, seems to have been beloved expression because of the way it gave voice to the ex expectation and hope. Thus, Paul sounds again, and in particularly emphatic and memorable way, the eschatological note of which the epistle began, as we eagerly await the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, and which echoes and re-echoes through this final chapter. Uh, so we get kind of here in the meaning. Uh, there's, I, I know we use it in our common table prayer, right? Come, Lord Jesus, be our gas. But really, like, longing for Christ's return. And we think uh, of the end of Revelation. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Uh, there should be a longing in our heart for the fulfillment of what Christ will bring. And we don't know if it will be soon, or it could be a long time from now. But at some point, Christ is going to fulfill that promise and come and so it is a heartfelt cry of his church and of his people uh, to long for the day of the Lord long for his coming uh, why well we just talked about because we love the Lord and, and we love his church and we love his kingdom and so we long to have that fulfillment uh, that Christ would bring and then moving on from the Marantha he moves into uh, uh, a benediction the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you my love to all of you in Christ Jesus amen and so Paul reminds them of his love for them uh, this is God inexpressible love toward him inspired Paul's love for his fellow saints Paul now adds a closing verse with it, which is unique in 1 Corinthians. My love is with all of you in Christ Jesus. Despite the harsh things he has had to say, he is still their father in Christ. And he still regards all of them as his beloved children in Christ. And this final expression of his love for them 
him. Paul models what he has just preached. Let all you do be in love. The apostle's fatherly love for his children is in Christ Jesus. Finally, the name of Jesus becomes the last word in an epistle devoted to restoring the church's faith and fellowship in him. Um, especially as we kind of talk throughout the book of 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul comes down pretty hard on them uh, because of their divisions, because of the ways in which they've been behaving, uh, because of the correction needed on them. Uh, he ends his, his letter just double downing on the fact that he personally, yes, Christ loves them, God loves them, but he personally loves them. He longs to see their repentance and the unity that Christ would bring about. He longs to also join with them again. We have that couple sessions ago uh, but he he loves them deeply himself and he can't wait to come be them so yes come lord jesus uh, but this grace and love of christ be with them but also let them know uh, the love that he himself paul has for them and so kind of what is our takeaway um marantha maybe that's a, a good word that you can maybe uh, learn today if you didn't know it before uh Paul's desire for unity and blessing, uh, a reminder always of that unity we have within the church, our brothers and sisters in Christ, both uh, of all time and in all geography. Uh, that's a great joy, uh, and we prayerfully uh, lift up our brothers and sisters throughout the world. Uh, we can't wait uh, until we will be with them, even ones we've never met before. Uh, we have all eternity uh, to spend with them and to know them. And uh, there is a unity in Christ Jesus. And then he also brings up uh, just we are called to love our Lord and to love his people. And, and so Paul here reminds us of, of that love. And if there is no love for the Lord in you, uh, only love for yourself, well, then you, uh, you should come under you are under a curse and you should be brought to repentance. And then f finally, just that desire for, for the Lord to come, uh, that love and that longing uh, for the Lord and for him to come with us. Uh, so there is uh, the end of 1 Corinthians. Uh, Paul uh, sharing with us just kind of those final words about what it means to be Christ's people, uh, to trust in him and to follow him. And I, I hope you are blessed uh, as you've gone through 1 Corinthians. I know we did some of this together uh, at church, and a lot of this has been online. And uh, But I pray that as you study his word uh, today, uh, uh, that you are encouraged. And not just, the obviously, the study we're doing together, but uh, in all the word uh, that the Lord brings before you. Uh, may you be blessed. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I pray for your people. Uh, may they know your love. Uh, may they love you. Uh, may they know the blessings they have. May they know uh, that uh, uh, their pastors love them, uh, that they're loved by their brothers and sisters in Christ in our church. And uh, there is love that unites us uh, with all your people uh, from all time and in all places. And uh, Lord, may we feel that love today and that great joy. Uh, and Lord, indeed, we pray for your coming. Uh, for uh, the resurrection of the dead and the life everlasting. And fill us with faith and hope uh, as we await that glorious day. All this we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, God be with you today, and uh, may God bless you always as you follow after him.